I'm Chubba Chatta and I'm here with the Bentley Continental GT Speed Convertible. For many decades, the only difference between Bentleys and Rolls Royces was the shape of their grills. But over 10 years ago, the two companies split apart and Bentley immediately established itself as the more sporting of the two. That was based on Bentley's racing heritage. Back in the 20s and 30s, Bentley actually won the 24 Hours of Le Mans five times, and they won it again about 10 years ago. Bentley is built on this heritage by building a series of inordinately powerful and effortlessly high-performing cars. This Continental GT Speed Convertible is a perfect example, and this is not a new car, it's the latest update of this version, and it shows how Bentley is trying to stay on top of that performance world in the luxury area. This car has more power, a new transmission with more gears, and several other upgrades to make it more powerful and faster. Now over the next two days, we're going to be driving these cars in sunny Nevada and also on California mountain roads. We're going to have every opportunity to ring this car out and we're going to tell you how it works. But first, let's go through some of the details on this car and see where its performance comes from. The Continental GT has been an eye-catching car ever since its introduction, and this latest speed convertible version is no exception. In the middle, we have the large, prominent grille that somehow looks very natural on these cars. There's also the four distinctive headlight elements, and then there are the large air intakes necessary to feed and cool the turbocharged 12-cylinder engine with 616 horsepower. Ever since its introduction, the Continental GT has had one key styling feature that really stands out, and those are these muscular rear haunches. A lot of cars have a little fender flare, but this is really big. It starts out about six inches wide and goes all the way back to being a foot wide, and it really gives this car a powerful look. It's almost like an NFL running back with the shoulder pads on. It looks strong, it looks fast, and that reflects the character of this car. The rear end of the Continental GT Speed is very clean. We have these two large taillight elements, and we also have these very large exhaust tips. They're not just tips, they're big because we have 616 horsepower of exhaust to expel, and you can't do that in a small pipe. And those exhaust tips are surrounded by this carbon fiber lower fascia that also has a bit of a diffuser effect. I don't know if it's real, but it looks cool. Another cool feature of this Bentley are these mirrors. They're carbon fiber, and it looks to be real carbon fiber, beautifully laminated. But they're not standard equipment. You'll have to spend $2,900 to get a pair of these on your Continental GT Speed. Also, you can see on this car that we have basically a carbon fiber fascia kit that goes all the way around the car. This looks to be genuine carbon fiber. It's subtle, it's not too big, but it really enhances the appearance of this car. One of the key updates on this new Continental GT Speed are the 21-inch wheels. That's up an inch from the previous car's 20-inchers, and they normally come with high-performance P0 summer tires, but it's a beautiful wheel with a lot of open area that lets you see the huge front brake rotors on this car. And this car has the $15,000 carbon brake package, which means it's a carbon uh, rotor that's much lighter than the normal cast iron rotor, gripped by this massive red caliper. Feast your eyes on the Continental GT Speed's 616 horsepower Energizer. It's a 6 liter W12 with twin turbochargers. Now you may not be familiar with W engines. Most 12s are V12s, and that means they have two banks of six cylinders each. Well, this W12 actually has four banks of three cylinders each. Two of those banks are in a very narrow V on each side of the, the engine, and so there's six cylinders on this side and two of these banks, and six more cylinders on this side and two of those banks. The prime benefit to this W layout is it's a very short engine. And that's critical in this car because the entire engine is actually in front of the front wheel axle center line. So you don't have room for a conventional big, long V12 engine. Now in this latest version of the Continental GT Speed, output has been increased. Power is up from 600 to 616 horsepower, and torque is up from 553 to 590 foot-pounds. Moreover, the engine is coupled to a new transmission. It's now connected to a ZF 8-speed automatic, which has two more gears than the previous version did. With 8 speeds, that means a wider spread of ratios, and on the highway, the car can run lower RPM for better fuel economy, but it also means all those ratios are a little bit closer together, so you can extract more performance from the elevated power. 
Now Bentley is claiming a zero to 60 time of 4.1 seconds for this latest version, but based on our previous test of these cars, we expect this one to get to 60 in the high threes. This is a full blast zero to 60 run. We don't know how fast this car will go, but I bet this is under four seconds. The transmission upshifts crisply at 6,300 RPM, nice firm shift, and we're already at 100 miles an hour, which is as fast as I want to go on this road. As much power as the Bentley Continental GT Speed has, it has even more traction. And that's why on that full power standing start acceleration run, we didn't even get a hint of wheel spin. Not only does it have a lot of weight, but it has all wheel drive. And we didn't even come close to breaking the tires loose. Today we're in colder country and we've got the top up and the Continental GT Speed remains very quiet. Top up or top down, this is one of the quietest convertibles I've ever driven. The road here is mostly straight and it's pretty open and low traffic in. I just looked down, we're cruising at 90 miles an hour. It feels like nothing in this car. Effortless speed seems to be this car's stock and trade. They ought to issue a radar detector with everyone because otherwise you're not gonna have a license for long. It's just so easy and so comfortable to drive quickly in this car. One of the reasons the car feels so comfortable at speed is because of that eight-speed transmission. Right now, the speedometer is showing 90 miles an hour, and the tachometer is showing 2,000 RPM. So the engine is just not working hard, even at relatively high speeds. Despite the tall gearing that provides that relaxed cruising, the Bentley's really responsive because the ZF automatic, when you floor it, doesn't just go down one or two gears at a time. It can go down three or four gears. I mean, we just went from eight to third in about two steps. And that responsiveness just really gets you going, not to mention having 616 horsepower. Now, as we get into the twisty corners, you definitely start feeling the weight of the Bentley. It goes through the bends very well, but it just doesn't change directions like a lightweight sports car. You've got to be paying attention. You have to turn in at the right time, and you've got to apply a little force to the wheel. It's capable, but it is a big car, and it never lets you forget that. The big brakes on this Bentley can erase speed effortlessly. They're huge rotors, they're big calipers, they've got all the power they need to slow this car down, even from the high speeds it's capable of. Brake feel is not bad, it feels a tad artificial to me though. When I first step on the pedal, there's instantly a resistance there that most brakes don't have. I mean, it's not a bad sensation. It actually takes a pretty good push on the brake pedal, which perhaps is not inappropriate to a car that's this heavy and this powerful. One feature this car has is an adjustable suspension. There's a button on the central console that you press, and that brings up a picture of the car on the LCD screen with a slider bar, and you can either use uh, touch buttons to go up or down, but there's basically four positions from comfort to sport. And in truth, the differences are not really profound. Uh, the difference between full sport and full comfort is clearly noticeable, but the individual steps are fairly subtle. I suspect that on this Bentley, like on most cars, we're not just changing the shock calibration, we're simply picking a different program. And when you're running on a certain road at a certain speed, it doesn't much matter which one you've picked, you probably end up with a very similar shock setting. Although there's a traditional sumptuousness to this Bentley's interior, it does have all the modern features. We have the LCD infotainment system, and in the instrument cluster, in addition to the big round traditional dials, we have another LCD screen right in the middle. It's a smaller one, but I can bring up different uh, pieces of information there. It'll tell me what my phone's doing. I can bring up uh, whatever I'm listening to, a trip computer. Uh, it'll tell me what's going on with the active cruise control. And of course, I can bring up a navigation screen, which doesn't give me the full map. I've got that in the center, but just gives me the directions about what's going on next. So it's an interesting blend of traditional and modern in this car. As you'd expect in a modern and expensive car, the Continental GT Speed Convertible has a power top controlled by a single button on the center console. 
The entire operation is automated and the top stows beneath a hard tonneau cover, producing a clean top-down appearance. It's also very comfortable. This seat is well contoured, it's very supportive, and the controls fit pretty well. For my taste, I'd probably like the steering wheel to come back a little bit more than it does, but I can get a pretty good driving position in here, and I think a pretty wide variety of people can too. I just checked our trip computer, and so far in the first 400 miles or so of this trip, we're averaging 19.4 miles per gallon. Now, we haven't been driving 90 miles an hour the whole time, but we've been on it pretty hard, and 19 miles per gallon is going to win you any fuel economy contest, but for a car this big and this powerful, it's pretty good. The steering in the Bentley is quite accurate. It's a little on the heavy side, but again, that's kind of appropriate uh, given how heavy the car is. And it's also appropriate given Bentley's heritage. Back in the 20s and 30s, when Ettore Bugatti was racing against Bentleys at Le Mans and other places, he once said that the Bentley boys made the world's fastest lorries, meaning world's fastest trucks. I wanted to check out the back seat of this Continental GT Speed. I know it's not primarily a four-seater, but it's a pretty big car, and it does have a real back seat. I'm getting in there from the passenger side because I already have the driver's seat set for me, and that's how I normally check uh, back seat room, to see how much room there is behind the front seat when it's positioned for someone my size. And it's pretty tight in here. I've got my feet under the front seat, but my knees have to be splayed out around the seat back because otherwise there's no room. Headroom's kind of okay, but my legs are so squeezed that the driver would really have to cooperate for me to spend more than 15 minutes back here. So after about 400 miles in this Continental GT Speed convertible, I've come to a few conclusions. What do I like? Well, I really like the sumptuous interior. It's beautifully finished and it just reeks of class. I like the exterior look of the car too. Same thing, it really stands out and you don't see one on every street corner. I like the sheer comfort of the car. The seats are great and the noise level is really low. It's gotta be one of the quietest convertibles on the market. And I love the power. It's just effortless, it's always there, and whenever you want speed, this car can deliver more than you're asking for. What don't I like about it? Well, it is a big, heavy car, and it performs well for its weight, but you can never forget that this weighs about 5,500 pounds. It's not a nimble sports car. I'm also a little disappointed that for a car this big and this heavy, it has such a small back seat and such a small trunk. It really is a two-seater, and that's the only way to treat it. And finally, it costs an arm and a leg. This car has a base price of $238,000, and with the options on this car, it actually stickers at about 290. Can any car possibly be worth $290,000? Well, the reality is that in this day and age, you can buy a pretty good car for about $30,000. And then to get a slightly better car, you probably have to double the price. And to get a slightly better car still, you have to double the price again. That's simply the way of the modern mass-produced world where great products are available at a very reasonable level. What you really have to ask yourself is, can you get a car that can do what this car can for less than $290,000? And those key qualities are performance, comfort, and exclusivity. You can certainly buy a car as fast as this for a lot less than $290,000, and you can buy this level of comfort for a lot less money as well. The exclusivity gets a little bit harder because high price tags buy exclusivity. And when you add in the comfort and performance, this car is actually pretty hard to beat at that kind of price. So if you value those three qualities tremendously, then this is a reasonable purchase. For the rest of us, I think we're just gonna admire it from afar. I'm Chabachata, and I'll see you next time.